Hello and welcome to this DC Velocity webcast, how CART.com builds a labor culture for operation success. I'm Dave Maloney, the, the group editorial director at DC Velocity. Thanks for joining us. With labor still in high demand, it takes more than higher wages to attract and retain the workforce needed to power your fulfillment operations. In our discussion today, we will focus on how a fast-growing multi-channel management and fulfillment platform at cart.com is establishing a winning, a winning warehouse formula through culture for both full-time and temporary workers. Our session today is presented by InstaWork. InstaWork connects businesses with go-to hourly workers near them that make it easy for everyone to work on their terms. For more information, visit instawork.com. Joining me today for our discussion is Mike Lenz, the Senior Marketing Manager at InstaWork, and, J and JB Saseda, who is the co-founder and the head of corporate communications at cart.com. So to begin our discussion today, first, Mike, let me turn to you. I want to, first of all, thank you again for sponsoring today's discussion with InstaWork. And we know that coming out of the 2021 peak, labor or the lack of it was all anyone in the distribution space was talking about. Can you tell me a little bit about what InstaWork is doing to help solve this challenge and what you saw in the market? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, we're really happy to be helping out, you know, putting on today's roundtable and really thankful for JB from card.com to be joining us. Uh, since I know in the conversations we've had, he's always bringing amazing insight into his operations. Um, for those who don't know us, InstaWork is a flexible labor platform for warehouse and distribution companies. To give you a little bit of a sense of how it works, we have over a million and a half workers signed up for our app nationwide, and we match them up with businesses that are seeking labor. So, you know, it helps businesses like warehouse operators to flex their labor force up and down to meet changes in demand. So sometimes that takes the form of a seasonal spike like the Q4 peak, um, or it could just be a rush of orders that are coming from a single customer that you then have to fulfill. Um, to give you a sense of where we're currently operating, um, we're in about 25 markets in the US and Canada. Um, and generally we provide labor within around 30 miles of most major metro areas. Um, and that's based on where the majority of our workforce is located. So in many ways, InstaWork is a new twist on the old temp labor model uh, that most warehouses have been leaning on to find workers for seasonal spikes in the past. Um, we just are able to account for some of the downsides of that model, whether it's fixed contracts, uh, no-shows on the part of workers, or just general accountability for workers. Um, and we solve that through our technology platform. So what we've seen is that it's allowed us to fill uh, shifts at an 85 to 90% fill rate uh, for shifts posted on our platform. Um, and so that, you know, in many ways, puts us above a lot of the competition in terms of uh, our ability to fill open shifts. So just a few weeks back, we published our state of warehouse labor report, where we took a look at 2021 results for light industrial businesses uh, to be able to take the pulse of how they're feeling going into 2022. I don't think the results were a major surprise. We found that 75% of businesses are not feeling ready for what's coming in 2022, um, with a large part of that driven by the labor shortage nationally. Um, I know I hear from a lot of operators, you know, where have all the workers gone? And the answer that we found is that people are looking for work in new ways. So our app allows our in-store professionals, as we call them, to find shift-based work that fits their life in a way that they often can't find in a traditional work arrangement. Many in-store pros have childcare or other family responsibilities or they might just prefer the ability to pick and choose their schedules and their workplaces. Um, they might want more variety in the work they're doing. So, you know, working a few shifts a week at a warehouse and others in the hospitality industry, which is another industry that we help staff. So I think when we look at what's happening within the labor market, it's that workers are finding new ways to find work in the first place. And what we see is that traditional temp agencies or hiring routes that a lot of operators are used to using are, you know, in many ways kind of going the way of the yellow pages. Um, you know, we were really fortunate to begin working with JB and cart.com last year uh, in their Austin distribution facility. And we've loved to see how they embrace the flexible workforce model to help them meet their, their very growing fulfillment volume. Um, and I know it's gonna be 
uh, going like rapid fire even more in 2022. So uh, with that said, I'll try to add some perspective throughout this discussion, but I mostly wanted to let JB talk about how he's been creating just a stellar culture for workers at cart.com facilities. Thanks, Mike. And now turning to JB, can you tell us a little bit about cart.com's business and the model that you have and also your operations? Yeah, you know, so so cart.com uh, was founded about a uh, year and a half ago. So it's it's kind of wild. We have about a thousand people, um, which is also wild given how young of a company we are. But um, it's ran by a, a lot of individuals with deep e-commerce expertise. And um, I think the, the sort of unifying uh, sentiment of, of all of the, the founding, uh, you know, uh, partners of the company is that you know, running and scaling a business is a challenge, both from software to data to people, et cetera. And um, we sort of claim, or, or not claim, you know, our goal is to try to solve the multi-tab problem, right? Like you want to start an online store and you've got to have, you know, one platform for the storefront. You've got to have another for your, uh, you know, uh, growth marketing, another for uh, your HRIS, like all of these different tools all in a bunch of places. And so our goal is really to build the the end-to-end e-commerce platform that can help you scale really quickly uh, without having to jump around to a bunch of different places to manage your growth marketing, your uh, predictive analytics, your fulfillment, et cetera. It's, it's one sort of bucket. So um, that's kind of the story of, of CART. Uh, as far as the way that we think about you know how to grow. Um, you know we, we we really believe that that you know data um, you know conquers all, and um, you know your gut decisions are going to help you get through a lot of the the challenges of scaling a business up. Um, but data really helps you make uh, decisions on the fly very quickly and um, and confidently. And one of the things that we love about working with Instawork. Uh, was that, you know, after years of, of you know, myself running a, a fulfillment center, a 3PL, um, you know, the, the challenges that we had with the, with the labor market were that, you know, unless you uh, were working with full-time employees or part-time employees, um, it was really difficult to, to know in the moment, like, am I going to get the number of, of temp staffers that I've, I've like requested today. And so um, I love the, the sort of data informed, um, you know, relationship that, that Instawork has with its labor force um, and, and the customers like us um, allows us to work in, re- in real time and make sure that, that we've got people in the door when we need them. Um, but additionally, the other thing that I really love is, is the feedback loop that we get. I mean, it, it's rare that uh, temp agencies are really able to provide a lot of data, uh, the smaller ones, at least the regionals, are able to provide a lot of data about what people's feedback is for them working within your facility. And at Card.com, we're really big on, on uh, survey, and one of our core values is speak up. Um, and so we, we love using survey data to understand how we're doing as an employer. And, you know, Instawork has really done that for us in a big way uh, through our partnership over the last year. JB, of course, every uh, everyone knows that last year was very difficult to find labor. It's still very difficult. But looking back at your 2021 peak, can you tell us a little bit about what you guys did differently to solve the labor challenges that you faced? Yeah, I uh, so you know it, it was our first year. So I, I built a 3PL that was founded um, back in about 2015. And uh, we were acquired by Card.com in July of last year. So we went into uh, into Q3, uh, you know, fresh off the acquisition, um, had a lot more, you know, uh, a lot more kind of intellect in the room uh, than what was previously available to us on our leadership team. And um, you know, one of the first things that we did was we said, "Hey, let's go out and and um, start to understand how people are doing what we were doing really well at a, at a kind of smaller regional scale." Um, at a more national uh, scale. So we were lucky to meet the folks at, at Instawork um, at a conference in, in uh, uh, August or September of last year. And um, they really opened our eyes to the way that they thought about um, temp agencies. Now, I, you know, I think the broad kind of umbrella to answer your question is that uh, we leaned more aggressively into temp uh, labor than we had in years past. Um, we typically ran a pretty high uh, FTE to temp ratio. Um, we were we were generally about eighty to ninety percent FTE to temp. Um, whereas I know a lot of facilities will run a fifty fifty or a sixty forty something like that. And so 
um, because of the type of work that we did and the types of partners that we have um, as clients, there's a lot of custom packaging. There was a fair amount of like tribal knowledge and things that um, you needed to be there for really like a week or two before you were really spun up and, and capable. And so last year, uh, what we did was we said we, we knew we wanted to lean into um, leveraging a, a, a temp partner of some sort, um, but we needed to, to better operationalize some of the things that weren't quite so scalable about uh, our fulfillment operations before, uh, namely custom packaging and things like that. Uh, we needed to do some things about our software to make sure that um, on day one you could be, you know, productive as a as a uh, team member. And then the last was we really just like visited our whole, you know, comprehensive temp strategy. So one of those was to kind of swap out a couple of the partners that we had and, and leveraged uh, in store work, um, and then also just have a deeper relationship with uh, the couple of other temp agencies that we kept um, and really tried to bring some of those, uh, the managers from within the agencies into our facility so they could really understand the work and, um, you know, just have a good, uh, you know, uh, domain expertise around what it was that they needed to staff for. Um, you know, I think a lot of times people sort of perceive temp labor in general as just kind of a mathematical problem of like, I can get this many orders out the door, so I need this many bodies. And inevitably, you're not necessarily you know, thinking about the churn or the time to productivity that uh, it'll take to spin them up. And so um, we really tried to uh, account for that. Like we knew that, you know, yes, we do have a mathematical number of temps that we needed to bring in. Um, but let's understand the nuance a little bit more. And then what can we do to decrease the amount of time it takes from them crossing the threshold of, of getting into our building for the first time and being productive um, and able to actually, you know, contribute to the workload. So uh, it was a really big focus for us this year, especially with what was happening in the labor market in the latter half of last year. Um, and so far, this was uh, has been our, our best peak season uh, yet, which is a really exciting accomplishment. That's great, JB. We want to remind our audience we will be taking questions at the end of today's broadcast. So if you have a question that is raised as we do our presentation, uh, be sure to type that into the question box and hit the submit button. We'll get to as many of those questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Um, turning back to Mike a moment, uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier that InstaWork recently published a state of warehouse labor report. Um, and you covered some of the opportunities with recruiting and retention. Um, within that report that operators might be overlooking. Can you share some of those insights from the report? Sure. Um, so for our report, we surveyed hundreds of light industrial businesses uh, to really get a pulse of what they experienced last year and trying to understand some of the tactics that they're using to find labor. So, um, you know, I think while pretty much across the board, we saw wage increases and bonuses used as a way to attract more workers. As that became more common, it was really more of a game of catch up for many operators. So. You know, competing warehouses in the area raised wages, so you did too. And at that point, it's not really a differentiator anymore. So you know, if I'm offering $15 an hour and my neighbor is too, uh, we need to find other ways to stand out as an employer. So what we found as underlooked tactics for both kind of keeping existing workers and finding new ones are what you might consider culture-driven benefits. So uh, for instance, flexible schedules were only offered by around 40% of businesses. Um, Certainly understand that it's easier said than done to implement this from an operational perspective. Um, given what we've seen when we survey our InstaWork professionals, uh, it's definitely a growing desire among workers when they're looking for an employer. Um, another underlooked area was career development opportunities, which we saw only around 37% of businesses uh, were really focusing on for their retention. So I think overall, uh, you know, what we saw last year was businesses trying everything possible to patch the gaps to some extent with financial incentives. Um, but there are definitely some less tangible sort of cultural changes that can be just as important to workers and that we don't see most operators embracing quite yet. Great. Um, JB, with uh, cart.com's operational workforce, what are some of the retention strategies that you use? I mean, I, I love what Mike said. Um, you know, we, we, as operators, I think it's so interesting for me to watch the amount of time and attention that's put into, um, you know, the, the, the useful life of the equipment that we buy, right? Um, so, and, and I guess one sort of like uh, clarification I can make is that, you know, I, I, I CART now run corporate communications because I've been an e-com 
uh, I've run, you know, uh, online stores. I've had a digital agency background, and then, um, and then also uh, more recently, I've run a 3PL. But, um, but, but I really, I've, I've spent the last seven years in logistics, and and it's always interesting for me to watch how many buildings or uh, you know large scale operations think so in depth about the infrastructure and the assets that are on the balance sheet and what the useful life of those is, what the ROI is. We spend a lot of time really drilling into that. And we find, we, 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 we think about, you know, um, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're going to build, uh, you know, a presentation around how we're going to use this in our facility. We run this up the chain. We make all of this advocacy uh, time uh, to our leadership teams to uh, make the case for why we should spend this money in this area. And we spend very little time, you know, like the, the warehouse industry isn't necessarily known uh, for an industry that's like rife with a bunch of great culture, right? Um, typically, when you think about, uh, you know, uh, industries with killer culture, you think about, uh, you know, tech companies or whatever, but, but everyone's kind of missing the mark when you sort of simplify culture down to that, right? Like culture is not about the, the like, ping pong table in the break room and the, you know, uh, cold brew that you have on tap in, in the break room. Um, culture is the approach with which you consider which problems you you as a company are willing to solve and how you're going to solve them. And so for, for our 3PL Salseda and um, for cart.com as a whole, we've decided that we don't want to just create jobs and, and numbers on a spreadsheet. We want to create jobs that people actually want. Right. And so that that takes uh, time in which you have to kind of pull yourself out of the business and work on it instead of in it. And so strategically, we've looked at a lot of things. We, we've asked ourselves, like, who is our target audience? Right. So um, one of the, the stories that I told uh, Mike and um, his team a handful of weeks ago uh, was about snacks in the break room. Right. So you think about the average temp you know, worker. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, has been in the, the maybe the temp world for a little while, um, maybe isn't making as much as some of your full time employees. Um, they, they've got a lower sort of income bracket that they sit within. And a couple of years ago, we had some temp workers coming through at a really large scale project. We we're shipping, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of items out a day. And um, we brought in this team. And we never really thought anything of it. We've been providing like name brand snacks for free for everybody in the warehouse for a while. But, you know, this was our first kind of four way for you into uh, using a large amount of temps. And one of the temp workers came up to me and he was like, man, I just cannot believe the kind of snacks you guys have in your break room. And we were like, what do you mean? And he was like, you know, you guys have Doritos in there. Like, I don't make name brand snacks wages. I mean, that, that was the way he described it. I don't make name brand wages, you know? He's like, I'm buying the off-brand stuff that's at the bottom of the shelf that's, like, over here. I'm buying the two-day-old bread. Like, you know, and 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 he was kind of, you know, self-deprecating and joking about it. But, it, I mean, it, it was true. And so we talk about that all the time. You know, like, I've been to warehouses where, like, the snack machine is a machine and you have to pay for it, you know, to get the stuff out. And so when we, we talk about the fact that we put these snacks out for our warehouse workers – um, you know, one, one of the questions David asked was like, you know, how do you, how can you guys afford to do that? And I, and I told him, I was like, you want to know what the budget is? You know, like one of our buildings at the time, it had about 100, 120 people in it or so uh, regularly. And uh, the, the budget that we'd established was $15 a month per person. So $1,500 on average per month, we were spending on these snacks that like may not seem like much to most people, but like when we sat down and we thought about like who our target audience was, it was this person, you know, this is the thing that motivates them. This is what they want. Then it's really easy for you to kind of work backwards and say, like, what can we do, right? So, again, for, for temp workers, um, you know, from a marketing perspective, like, I see the folks, uh, the Shinesty, for example, a really great online store um, that uh, my, my other company has done some work with over the years. Like, the Shinesty, I guarantee you, their marketing team knows exactly who their target audience is, right? It's people between a certain age with a certain sort of type of, like, psychographic uh, motivation, um, and, uh, maybe their business didn't start out with, with that like specific thing papered and, and written down, but over time, there's no doubt that their marketing team probably put that sort of stuff together that then allowed them to inform all of the decisions they make as a marketing team creatively, right? Like what types of emails we're going to send out, what types of posters and designs and things that we're going to create for the website. All of that is built by this like playbook that, that is, uh, focused around like targeting a specific group of people. Well, we can do that as operators too, right? If we know that we need people in here, we can either sit on our ass and complain about the fact that nobody wants to work anymore, which is not true, 
or we can help ourselves stand out by realizing that like we as operators have a marketing job too. We're marketing to people and trying to entice them to come to work for us. Right. So if labor, if the unemployment market was 15 percent, great, we could totally just sit on our butt and people will just show up. But it's not right. So you've got to do the same thing that the people on the front of your business are doing in terms of thinking through who it is that you're targeting and then how you target them in whatever way that is. So a couple of things that, that we do. One, our job descriptions don't suck. They speak to the people that we're trying to motivate, right? So what do we say to people who are uh, maybe lower on the entry level, their, their associate uh, level people? We talk about career trajectory, growth opportunities within the company, um, you know, perks that may not be available to people elsewhere, right? Like we provide 401k with matching to associates. Like there aren't a lot of warehouses that do that. Um, we, uh, we, we call out things like, uh, you know, our, our overtime policies and things like that, that, that might entice them. So that's kind of like on the front end. Um, our, our interview process is more robust than the average, right? So, um, we, we make sure that we're, we're having kind of a, a, a two way conversation. Um, we, we can hire people as fast as any other company out there, but we, we have more touch points than I think a lot of other, uh, you know, warehouse, uh, and fulfillment operations do, but we've recognized that if I can spend a little bit more time per person on the front end, I'm going to spend less time on the back end exiting people who weren't a good fit for the company and less time having to go back and redo this work because I made a bad hire on the front end, right? So it's all about really just being deliberate in your decision making and culturally making a decision about what is the problem that you want to solve hiring and how do you want to solve it by, you know, coming up with a strategy and figuring that out. So, uh, you know, you don't end up in the, the kind of conundrum that a lot of organizations do in which they just sit there and complain about their people ops and saying like the recruitment, you know, team isn't getting enough people in my, you know, uh, temp agency can't send me the, you know, a, a good person, um, for once. Well, you know what, you have a job as a manager. Um, I have a job as a manager to define what success looks like and providing that psychographic blueprint is the best way to do it. Doesn't mean you got to do snacks. Doesn't mean you got to do any of those things, but just understand who your target customer is and uh and build a storefront you know a back-end hiring funnel that uh is something that's enticing to them instead of just an also ran on on indeed or craigslist so um that's my that's my culture rant yeah but that's a good rant um and of course in the time of the, the great resignation that we're all facing right now with people not working or moving from job to job culture is really important and, and you've shared some of the examples of what you have done to help build your culture. How do you think your culture compares with other companies that are in the space? And what kind of feedback have you gotten from people who come into your building in addition to the, the fellow who commented about the, the, the great snacks that you have in your break rooms? Simple stuff. Uh, we have music on in the warehouse. I mean, I've been to, uh, I've had clients come into our building. I remember we were working with a company called The Chive a uh, handful of years ago. And they were working with a really large scale operator that everybody's heard of. Um, and uh, the, the, the management team came to our building and they heard some, you know, music playing. And they were like, man, I just feel better in this place already. And I was like, why? And he said, dude, we went by our other provider that we're about to leave and move to you guys for. And it's like everyone's in there. It's quiet. And, you know, it's it's like a, a walking funeral, or, you know, like a, like a just like everyone's about like on their way to a funeral. Right. <laughs> like what a terrible way. Like who in your company is going to go be an advocate for you if going to work is this like, you know, warehouse version of the movie office space. Right. Like what a terrible, terrible product to be selling as an employer. Um, so little things like that, like it doesn't cost money to walk around a warehouse and ask people how their day is going. It doesn't cost money to, um, you know, as a management team, get out on the floor and ask people, you know, what's pissing you off, right? Like we literally have a meeting every week for everybody at the company uh, called a level 10 meeting, meaning like it's a, you, we want to, we want to nail this meeting. Everyone's looking forward to it. And they're writing in a 10 every week. And one of the things we ask is what's pissing you off. And they're going to say, oh, you know, there's that one pallet jack that just squeaks like crazy every time. And I've been asking people to fix it, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's the type of stuff that will piss somebody off and make their head explode. And then they want to leave a company. It's like these little things that if, if management would just get out on the floor and ask people what's pissing you off and what's you know, in your way, um, you can get it done. You can create scalable ways to do that. But, you know, I just I think our the, the thing that was different about our industry or our building was, um, 
you know, I didn't come in from, from a logistics background. I actually spent my, the first part of my career in advertising. So I didn't really know any different. Um, I just thought that it was like completely normal to blast music in a warehouse. I thought it was completely normal to, um, you know, uh, do some of the things that we did uh, like that. And so um, a year or two ago, we did a, a, a relay race. Like we wanted to just kind of mix up the different departments, right? Like every, every company has... Um, like this, this uh, sort of cultural debt in their head in which people sort of tell themselves stories about the other departments, right? Like, oh, receiving is always screwing up or so-and-so. And 90% 90 time, 90 of the time, it's just because those people don't ever really talk outside of just like the, the pure experience of working together. And there's probably some systematic problem that's creating the issue, but they eventually just kind of blame each other and just create this terrible environment. So we were really big on like every 30 days, we'd have some kind of social event at the company. Um, and uh, they don't have to be expensive. Uh, one that we did was we um, we did a relay race with the entire warehouse. We we split the team, the company up into teams. There were like I don't know, ten teams of like ten or fifteen people each in, in one of our facilities, and um, and it was basically a Q four uh, relay race in which there were multiple steps, and the, the sort of end goal was that you were creating a package that was you know fully packed with all the right items in it. And then it was handed off to me and, and one of the other uh, leadership team members at our company. And we played the delivery driver role and basically took the package and threw it against the wall and like tried to destroy it. And whichever team, you know, went through all of the kind of crazy steps, the error codes and all the crap that we created within the relay race, whichever team could, you know, basically deliver this package, on, you know, on time and in full. And then when we opened it up, it wasn't broken. Like they won. That was using all the stuff that was laying around the building. We took product that you know customers no longer needed, and then we, um, you know, that they'd given us, and then we used cardboard boxes and stuff that were just lying around. It's not like we went out and bought some sort of relay race, you know, package. It just took us, you know, the 15 minutes to think about how to do it, and then ask our people team, like, hey, uh, could you guys come up with like a relay race concept and then schedule it, and we'll make it the last 20 minutes of the day on a Friday. Um, and we'll put it on pay, pay time and this like little bit of an investment of these people kind of standing around working together. We'll pay dividends because people from other departments who typically don't talk and instead just complain about each other will communicate with one another. And so we, we've seen a direct correlation when we survey people. We've seen a direct correlation where like in the months, two, two or three months where we might get really busy and we don't do a couple of them, like sentiment will kind of dip. And then we'll have one of these little events, super small investment, super low lift. And then boom, it's like everyone's like, oh my God, I love it here. So you don't got to like, you know, give people free cars and all these like kind of crazy perks. People just want to be seen and heard. And if you can go around and help them be seen and listen to them, they're going to like love you and work. At, you know, my, my buildings, I'm in Austin, a hot, hot city, and they're not air conditioned. And I have people that have been working for us for seven years and who are like, I love it here, have no reason to go anywhere else. They could make money, more money probably working in other places, um, but they feel seen and they feel heard and that, that goes a long, long way. Right, and, and appreciated too. People feel mm -hmm. that they wanna be valued. But you're in a business, of course, and you're in a business to turn a profit. So mm -hmm. how do you balance the need for productivity with maintaining your company's values and culture? You can push people more when they like it there. I mean, you know, everybody knows this, that uh, Johnny Paycheck song, Take This Job and Shove It. Like, Johnny Paycheck got pushed to the edge of, of uh, hating his job because he hated his boss. I mean, li listen to the lyrics of that song. You know, go look it up if you've never heard that song. He's talking about his boss, you know, thinking he's better than everybody else, like, doesn't really, you know, he thinks this guy's a total jerk. And so eventually he just gets pushed over the edge and is like, I'm out of here, right? And so... My wife, who uh, has a background in kind of cultural development and engagement, um, she joined the company very early on and helped me scale it up before we sold the cart. And you know, it, it's it's no um, it's no secret when we were selling the company, I, I told everybody like she's actually probably the more valuable person in the deal um, if you're trying to take what we're doing and, and inject it into cart.com. And and our CEO, um, when he came and visited us, that was exactly what he said. I mean, he went straight to her and he said. I want you to take what you did here and make this the card.com culture as we scale up and like, you know, build out our fulfillment operations. And so she runs, um, you know, our, um, yeah, our people ops, you know, on that side. But, you know, I think that, that, um, you know, from a profitability perspective, the thing that's funny about her is like, she cares very much about people being taken care of, but it's, it's, and she's not nefarious when she says, it, says this, but she's like, you can push them further, right? Like, 
you can, if you create a really highly engaged workforce, they want to work harder for you. It's not that you even have to really push them. It's that they're motivated to make you happy because they want to stay here, right? So I think it's it's interesting to see the lack of self awareness. I think in all industries, not just ours, um, the lack of self awareness people have about this. Look look at the look at the, the the market leaders in most industries, right? So Chick fil A pays people most uh, more money than most people do uh, get paid at most uh, fast food restaurants. They make more money per restaurant than every other fast food chain on the planet, and they're only open six days a week, right? Mm-hmm. So and they're not charging significantly more or anything like that than everybody else. HEB, uh, they're a grocer based here in, Austin, in uh, San Antonio that's all over Texas. They pay people more, um, significantly better culture. If you look at their ENPS uh, ratings, uh, they crush it. Wildly profitable, wildly profitable. Costco, Southwest Airlines. Uh, Southwest Airlines, actually, you could make more money as a pilot in other at other airlines, but people like working there because it's awesome. And Herb Kelleher, when he founded that company, made the decision that they were going to invest in the culture and make sure that people wanted to be at the company. And that's that that shows through in the experience that you have on that plane versus, you know, American Airlines, where they're going to you know trip you on the way in the door and, you know, kick you on your way out. So it's like it, it's all about this like little stuff. And I mean, look at those companies, right? Southwest Airlines outperformed the entire uh, airline industry pretty much its entire existence. Um, it was it was turning more planes. Uh, in, a, in a single day, you know, uh, at the gate than, than any other air, airline was. So you don't, you know, money, money sometimes to people in a weird way can be a signal that things are bad at your company. So if like you only think that that's, if you think that that's the only motivating factor for folks, um, it can be a signal. I mean, I, I just hired someone recently uh, for my PR team um, who mentioned that there was a company that was was offering, you know, tens of thousands of dollars more than, than we were at, at cart. Um, but he was like, it was a flag. It was like, what, what's wrong there? Like, why do they have to pay people so much? Right. So like, th- think about folks that work in, you know, at law firms, like they make a ton of money, but they're all working around the clock, you know? So, so money doesn't have to be the only motivating factor. Sometimes career development opportunities, um, a second chance, you know, a, especially with the group of people we're talking about today with temps, like, that that you know, second chance and and and, and upward mobility are, are huge, huge motivating factors for people that don't cost you anything. You know, it, it it doesn't cost you anything to consider hiring within for a management role instead of going external. You can just make that decision to coach someone up versus hiring someone who already knows, right? So, um, yeah. So that that's that that's kind of my stance on it. You just mentioned temporary workers, and it sounds like you've been successful in bringing in workers from sources like InstaWork to achieve this. Um, but how do you integrate part-time or temp workers with your full-time staff? Talk to them like everybody else. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, I was joking with Mike a, a couple weeks ago that, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been to facilities and I've actually heard people say this, which is just, you know, unbelievable to me. But, um, you know, you'll, you'll walk into a facility and, and i I saw that uh, one of the one of the warehouses we visited had a um, metal detector on the way in the door, and I, I asked the operator, "I was like, what's going on here? Like, you you have a metal detector, but you sh- you ship clothes. Like, what do you think people are stealing from y'all?" And he's like, "Oh, I'm not protecting you know my my inventory. I'm protecting the you know my warehouse from like, the people that we're bringing in." And I was just like, "What standards are you setting that that like you have to think about?" your building is like a prison that you're having to protect people from one another um, in that regard, right? Like how low, how little do you think of the people that you employ that that's how you think about it, right? Like have some standards. Um, and um, it just, I was, I was flabbergasted by it. So anyway, um, the, we've always considered temps the same, right? Like we just say, look, if you work for us, even if it's for a day and through a, a partner, you're, you're an employee here. So um, you're gonna get an onboarding. Um, we're going to talk through, you know, all the kind of same procedures and everything else. Um, you're welcome to join our company wide meetings if you'd like. Um, and then, uh, you know, if we're bringing in lunch, like I've seen this happen all the time where, you know, they might bring in lunch for like the office or something like that and the full-time employees in the warehouse, but they purposely don't include any of the the other workers. We always just budgeted for like the entire headcount. So, um, that, that actually resulted in a, quite a handful of, of, uh, converts, you know? And so we had people who maybe struggled to get jobs elsewhere, came in through temp agency, and then really just were like blown away at the experience in our building. And they were like, I just, I mean, we've, 
it's been a comment that people have made, like, you guys treat me like a human. Um, and that in itself, as sad as that is, that that's a, a, a bar that they kind of have to ha set for themselves. Um, there are a lot of places where people don't feel like they're treated that way. Um, they've got kind of a, some sort of, you know, signification or, or a signal that they're a, a temp and they kind of get treated differently than everybody else. So um, you can treat everybody the same way. Um, you can have different approaches to hiring and firing. Um, you know, we, we have always said that um, if you come into our company and convert to full time and you came through an agency, you're probably like we're going to have a shorter uh, temper, I guess, you know, for lack of a better term, um, or, or um, we'll provide less consideration for bad behavior if you came in that route and maybe skip our typical hiring process. Um, but we're going to give you the same chance. And that's, that's been a big you know, thing for us. And, and um, some of our most successful uh, team members all came in through, through temp agencies. And then, you know, in the long term, they just tell us that uh, it really was about the fact that we created contrast. You know, it was a, a drastically different experience than they had had at a lot of the other companies that they had worked with. So. Thanks, JB. Um, um, turning one, again one to more, Mike. One thing I will add on that. Yeah, is, sure, please. If you just go ask them, and that, that's the other thing, just go ask people, like, what do you like or not like? What would make you want to stay here? Um, and, and that's a key piece of this, right, is, is like we, we ran uh, and we do run twice a year an uh, employee net promoter score uh, survey. The first question is, would you suggest this company, working at this company to friends or family? And that's a pretty big, you know, sort of uh, question to ask someone. And effectively, you know, the way that NPS works is like, unless someone rates you an eight, nine, or 10, um, that's a promoter. If it's like a six through seven, it's just kind of benign. And anything below that is actually a detractor, meaning like they, they wouldn't, you know, actually go for it. And so historically, our facilities always ranked around like a 20 to 30, um, which is like the net promoter score that Google and Facebook want to have, like in their offices. Um, and that is not hard to get to if when you survey, even if it's below, like, the, you know, if it goes and dips low, just read what's in there and help people solve those problems. Um, you don't ask your clients, how can we be better? And then ignore their feedback. Um, because if you did, they'd leave. Um, replace client with employee, same thing. So anyway. Good point. Thank you. Mike, um, Instawork does some pretty unique things to make sure that there is some consistency with the workers at your partner companies. Can you talk more about how you achieve this? Sure. Um, and, you know, just to touch on JB's point around asking for feedback, um, you know, that's, that's something that we collect via the Instawork app uh, from our, from our Instawork professionals after they've worked a shift. So, you know, they're able to rate the employer that they're working for um, and provide specific feedback. And I know JB and team have really taken that to heart. Um, you know, I think they had something like a 4.98 out of five rating, uh, you know, over the fall peak. So um, clearly they're doing something right with their culture there and gathering that feedback and putting it to use. So, um, you know, that's a, a really useful tool that a lot of our partners have found is the ability to take that feedback um, and improve their operations, whether it's for their full-time employees or, or the in-store professionals that they're bringing in. Um, when you ask about consistency and, and kind of, you know, how we get workers uh, used to the work environment and, um, you know, what we're doing with the tool, that's, that's a great question. So, you know, after an in-store pro has worked a shift, uh, we ask our partners uh, to rate their performance, again, on a one to five scale. Um, so the pros with higher ratings get put into what we call a business's roster. So what that starts to do is to build up over time a bench of workers who are familiar with your business, uh, the expectations you have for your, your warehouse and your operations, and any sort of shift requirements, whether it's what to wear, when, where to show up. Um, and as we add to that roster over time, workers start to see your shifts posted uh, before anyone else. So you know, what we usually start to see here is consistency with the same workers coming back again and again. And I think in the case of cart.com, you know, when they're creating such a positive work environment, those workers want to come back. Um, mm -hmm. And so by doing a great job, they get the opportunity to, to pick up those shifts first. Um, and what we see is some partners will start building up a roster where they have upwards of you know, 500 professionals that 
are all familiar with how to get their job done and the different expectations of the business. So this is a really key factor, uh, especially when we work with larger warehouse operators, um, you know, to start building up this sort of on-demand pool of workers who are familiar with the operations. Um, you know, it's a little bit different than the temp agency world where you never know who you're getting. Um, you know, you might get one batch of workers the first week and, you know, a totally different batch the, the next. Um, we're kind of creating some visibility there for the businesses to see who's on their roster and then uh, putting up the call for those folks to come back and, and do the job again. Great. Um, JB, Mike just talked about that feedback tool that InstaWork provides, and I know that you utilize that. Can you share a little bit about what you do with the, the data that you collect or the feedback that you have um, and other tools and such that you might use in eliciting feedback from your full-time staff? How, how does that all work to improve your culture? Yeah, you know, I think, um, so So we have uh, a couple of different avenues with which that is that data is used. Um, the primary person who, who checks that InstaWork uh, rating is actually the GM um, at each building, right? So like our Austin facility, for example, is one of our smaller facilities, but uh, the GM there, I mean, he he's like, constantly uh, beating his chest about it. Like he'll, I'll see him take screenshots of it and then throw it into the Slack channel to let not just like the leadership team know that they're doing well, but like he, he broadcasts this to the greater company um, and says like, oh my God, look how well we're doing, right? So the coworkers in the building who recognize when we get really busy, right? Like we're all, especially for anyone who's been in the 3PL space knows how rarely you get like an accurate forecast. Um, you know, and, and uh, we sort of joke that, that you know all all models are wrong and the good ones aren't dangerous. And so, from from a labor you know uh, planning perspective, you're always going to get caught on your heels. And we try to really emphasize to our team members that you know they have a role to play in this too, right? It's not purely just managers; it's the experience that those temp workers have when they come to the building with the coworkers, because that's really who they're going to spend most of their time with. So if you don't want to be caught in a position where when our clients send us too much stuff to do and we don't have enough people and then you just have to stay late, make sure that you're maintaining our ability to actually recruit really killer people, right? And you have a, you have a role to play in that. So um, so that that's one one thing. We really just make sure that we're, we're passing that information out. Um, the other thing is is really it, it rolls up into our people department, right? So we hate the term HR. We don't use it, you know, modern day kind of the like sort of in thing, I guess, is to call it a, a people department. HR handles paperwork. The people department makes sure that we have the right people in the right seats. And so ours happens to also do the HR stuff, but like they hate the HR term. And their concern is really with making sure that we're building like a people first organization. And so they've got metrics m much like everybody else, you know, and, and we track that net promoter score and we ask ourselves much like our SLAs, like, how are we doing? And so the baseline survey that we do twice a year is there just to, um, you know, kind of give us a sense of like how we're we doing year over year. Um, but, you know, some stuff you're going to be able to solve really quickly, like, hey, the ice maker in the break room's broken. Like, oh, shit, we didn't know. Cool. Let's go fix it. Um, and then there's stuff like when in the early years of us building our 3PL, we were in this kind of dusty, crappy old warehouse. And it would show up every year, twice a year. People were like, when can we get out of this, like, dust box, we're ready to be in any building, whatever. Um, and we went back and we showed our people, especially those that have been with us for four or five years, we went and showed them like, your voice matters. You know, we don't just ask because we want to ask for the sake of it. Like we actually take this and, and it informs when we go and do our leadership quarterly offsites and we plan out the next quarter, next quarter, next quarter. Um, those offsites don't just include our operations and, and leadership team. Um, our leadership team has a people person on, on, you know, at the table. So when we're thinking about how to improve the company's bottom line and all of that, there's equal representation of a person whose job it is to kind of represent the company. You know, like uh, we actually had somebody um, ask our CEO, like right after we sold our company to, to cart um, our CEO did a, a really great Q and a, and somebody asked him what his thoughts were on unionization. And, you know, I was actually on vacation, so I was listening to this on my phone, and I was like, oh, my God, like, did seriously when my employees, like, three weeks after we sold the company, start talking about unions in the building. And, you know, like, historically, like, I'm not anti-union. Like, I actually like unions, but I, I thought, like, oh, my God, what, is, what kind of conversation are we going to have, you know, as a result of this? And um, our CEO answered it really well. He was like, 
I don't think I have enough information to say whether I'm pro or against, um, but I can tell you how I feel philosophically. He's like, I, you know, the mechanics of you'd have to pay a union or not or whatever. He's like, great. Like y'all can probably figure out whether that makes sense for you. For me as a company's leader, I just want to build a place that, that advocates for our people on, on their behalf so well that they don't even feel like they need one. You know, like, I mean, the idea that, that, that we would do such a poor job managing the company and our labor force that people feel so unheard that they have to get together as a group and threaten to quit regularly to get us to change and improve things. What a terrible place to work, you know? And, and that's not, you know, that's an oversimplification of why people, you know, unionize. Um, but at the end of the day, when you really distill down, like why do people feel the need to go that route? It's because they don't feel like they have a means for communicating the things that concern them. And if a company can develop a really killer two-way street between its labor force and the people managing the entire operation, you rarely end up having to get to those kind of like organizational fisticuffs because it, you, you can show progress in the way that, you know, my wife did. We, we, we would take these surveys and show, look, we did this, we did this, we did this. You gave us objectives and we went and solved them, right? So accountability is a two-way street. And I think if, if you're good about, um, you know, taking the feedback that people give you, um, and doing something about it, then, you know, you're going to create a healthy place in much the same way that you expect the people who work for you to take the feedback that you give them as a manager and to go improve and, and react to it. Right. So, um, I, uh, I've been talking a lot on this talk, but I always, I always, um, you know, emphasize the importance of as a manager, having two ears and one mouth and making sure that you, you use that ratio in practice. You of course have your peak season coming up in, in 2022. So, how do you feel about your operations as you head into the 2022 peak? Um, I mean, I feel a little bit better because I'm not having to run them anymore. So from a, a stress level perspective, uh, that, that's been uh, one change that's been um, nice. But I think, you know, our, uh, we've got some really killer operators uh, in there. Um, I just transitioned out of that role and into uh, the, the um, you know, uh, communications role here recently. But um, we have some some amazing people. Our, uh, you know, th there's we've got a really amazing operator, Eric Schwab, who's one of our directors um, and oversees uh, one of the, the regions here in Texas. Really, really killer operator um, is doing some amazing work in our New Jersey facility. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, CART, CART has, has been a really uh, fun experience for us. And, and, um, there's really strong cultural alignment, um, but there's also been really strong operational alignment. And so, um, we've been able to pair sort of like some of the concepts that, that we really, um, had, uh, hypotheses about as we were building our business up and, you know, operationalize and scale those in a much larger way. And so it's been fun seeing the, the, you know, various parts come together. Um, and, you know, the partnerships like the one that we have with, with Instawork really start to flourish. And, and, you know, we were successful with them just in the very short amount of time that we started working with them last year. Um, so now that we actually have time to plan instead of just saying like, holy crap, uh, you know, November's around the corner, can you get us people? Um, now we have sort of an approach and, and um, I, I'm even more excited about our ability to staff to, um, you know, our needs and, and you know, meet the uh, really crazy uh, amount of volume that I know we're going to see this peak season. Great. Thank you. Mike, uh, before we get to our question and answer session, and we again remind people to get their questions to us, and many of them have, uh, do you have any final advice, Mike, on how folks in our audience can get more, um, how they can actually get started with InstaWork professionals in their operations? Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward process, um, as simple as going to our website, getting started, talking with uh, one of our partnership managers, and and Usually we like to talk about a specific facility to get started. So, you know, understanding how many workers are in the area, you know, trying to understand what positions you're looking for to see if it's the right fit. So um, from there, you know, it's a quick process to get started and, and bringing in your first professionals for shifts. Um, and I think over time, starting to build that roster, getting that, you know, um, that strong bench that you can pull from when uh, the volume really starts to pick up. So. Um, I think like JB mentioned, you know, we started working with cart.com last year. They've started to build that up at, at their locations and um, we're really looking forward to working with them again this year and, and continuing that positive momentum. So, um, you know, you can just hop on our website at instawork.com uh, and request a, a conversation to get started there. Yeah, right. 
Thank you. I think it's time to move to our question and answer session. We have just a few minutes left in our webcast time, so we'll try to get to as many of these as we can. Uh, question for J, for JB. Mm -hmm. um, I, this person is saying, I see younger generations really getting into it around how managing people and really uh, and how you really um, correlate with your thoughts. They, they say they correlate with your thoughts. Mm -hmm. When you've gone into facilities that you have, um, people that have to work for them a very long time and they're fixed in their ways on how to manage people, how do you influence them to change to a more dynamic and modern way of managing the staff? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, cultural change is, is dif difficult. Um, you know, I, I don't think that there's anybody that has like perfected that, um, you know, on, on, you know, its face. Like at the end of the day, culture sort of starts and ends when someone's hired and fired. Right. And so um, it's not to say that people can't change in the middle, but building a culture of whatever you want to kind of fill in the box, culture of, you know, uh, accuracy, culture of whatever that requires, you know, the going back to the first comment that I made around identifying your target audience and your target customer, um, a really, really sharp eye at the beginning. Now, that doesn't mean that, that you know, like with CART, for example, when we were sold um, or when we sold the company, um, we knew that there was like some slight differences culturally, and that might mean that some people would leave. Um, but we also knew that that might re-engage some people who had been at our company and maybe weren't quite as aligned with us, but now under the sort of new ownership might like it a little bit more or whatever. Um, but Robert Richmond, uh, he was the chief culture officer at Zappos, right? So Zappos is kind of like the, the end all be all of killer customer, um, experience companies, right? They always say that they're a, they're not a shoe company. They're a customer uh, service company that happens to sell shoes. And, um, I saw him speak uh, a handful of years ago and he talked about how, um, you know, most companies don't die from uh, asphyxiation, right? Like they don't die because of a lack of oxygen or lack of business. Most of them die um, because of like indigestion, right? And so what he meant by that is that, you know, uh, companies will sort of like stop um, exploring new ways to solve problems and things because they just kind of have a general malaise uh, that develops over time. And then they don't really push the ball forward, right? Like look at Barnes and Noble, right? I mean, they, they could have been the Amazon, they could have been whatever, but they just sort of stopped uh, you know, really trying to, uh, they weren't motivated to try to do anything differently. And so I think it requires a little bit of the management team constantly feeling the need to, to stir it up a little bit and like keep things fresh. Um, but if you know, as a, as a people team or a manager or whatever that might be, that you have a different way that you want to approach it, define what success looks like and ask yourself, do the people that sit in those seats that are managing these people, do they get the job? Do they want the job? And do they have the capacity for it? Meaning like, do they have the time and bandwidth? And get the job is like, you know, we used to run it this way, but now we're going to run it this way. Do you understand? And can you do that? Do you have the skill set necessary? And secondarily, do you want to do it? You know, if you're like, well, now I'm stuck in my ways, I prefer it. Well, you know what? The needs of the company are changing. And it sounds like this person might not be a fit anymore, you know? Um, so not saying you got to go out and fire everybody, but I think clearly defining um, what success looks like and then boosting it and making sure that you're emphasizing that publicly and saying, hey, I really like how this person's doing this. This is how we want to do it, whatever. Like that's how you you start to get stuff to, to kind of shift in the direction that you want. It doesn't mean you have to go out and, like I said, fire everybody, but I think it will eventually, you know, for some people who maybe are stuck in their ways, will start to see a difference in, in approach and, and maybe say, like, I want to do that because I see that my boss and the leadership team is really into this approach. Um, or they're going to go, there's a new way to run things around here. It's not really my way, and I'm, I don't really feel like I'm fitting in. I'm going to leave. And a lot of times people will just self-exit, and then that gives you the right you know, opportunity to kind of recruit in the person that you want or level up somebody from within the company, et cetera. But we've had that. I mean, our company – um, in the seven years that we were running it, um, went through a lot of change. I mean, we went from being zero people to, you know, over 120 and, um, the people who loved it when we were 15 did not love it when it was 120 and the people who were there at 120 would not have liked it when it was, you know, 10 or 15 of us. Right. So I think it, it's completely okay for a business is, you know, needs to change. And, um, you know, Robert, Robert Richmond's kind of concept or, or comment on this was that, uh, the best way to change a culture is to to create the new one that makes the old one obsolete. 
And, you know, people in the old one will decide, you know, not to change because you're forcing them. They'll change because this one looks so bad relative to the one that you're building. Right. So that that takes a team effort and, you know, just a concerted effort around plans and and thinking about that stuff regularly. When you have uh, uh, operations that have uh, both warehouses and offices, our next Mm -hmm. uh, viewer would like to know, do you find that the communities mix? Or, or do warehouse people stick with warehouse people and office people stick with office people? Or do you treat them as two separate communities? Yeah, look, we're, we're designed uh, as humans. You know, we're literally wired to be attracted to uh, people who are like us, you know, whether it's organizationally or whatever that is. You know, it's just like it kind of happens that you're like, oh, they also work in my department. So I'm going to go work with those people or talk to those people instead of like the people in the office because they dress differently than me or whatever. Right. So that is going to happen. I think it's just kind of the, the, the nature of, of like organizational structures. We're just wired to do that. Um, so you have to kind of design a set of practices that break that a little bit. So that um, that relay race thing like that, that was one that we, we do for that purpose. Um, our team meetings. Uh, we used to hear all this kind of weird sentiment from people in the warehouse complaining that the customer service team never really had to work because they were just sitting on their butt all day. And so what we did was we started having um, the customer service team share really terrible emails that they had received from customers where like the, the customer was rude or called them a jerk or called them an asshole or wh- whatever they might have done. And uh, we would basically, you know, share that in team meetings to show people like, yeah, you might have to work on your feet all day, but you don't have it like both of y'all have crappy parts of your job, right? Like you have to work on your feet you get like, you know, denigrated by people who have never even met you in real life, you know? And so we try to create these like really, you know, lighthearted ways to create connective tissue around the business. Um, you know, Slack has been a really great tool for that because uh, what, like all of our workers are in, in one Slack channel. So they all see what one or the other are doing. Um, but then we did little stuff too, like during peak season, um, it was required that anyone in our warehouse or in our offices had to go work in the warehouse at least one shift. Um, and that helped quite a bit because then you have people, you know, suddenly the, the, you know, non ops people are coming in and going like, man, I can't believe how hard it is to deal with that client. Right. Like we had somebody from the sales team do that. They, um, it was always a thing that the warehouse complained about the sales team, not really understanding how the work happened in the warehouse. And then they would bring clients in that were just not a good fit and, uh, and then, you know, move on and, you know, take their spiff and, and, you know, ride off into the sunset. And so when you take salespeople and you make them work in the warehouse, they get a lot better at qualifying leads and making sure bad clients don't make it in the door. Right. So mm-hmm. little things like that, I think help quite a bit. Um, and again, it doesn't take much. Uh, it just takes a plan. Um, it doesn't cost much, you know, I mean, what you, what you spend in pulling people off the floor for 10 or 15 minutes to have a team meeting, um, you know, maybe you save that because you don't do them, but I guarantee you spend it in like operational efficient inefficiency because people aren't aligned with the goals of the company or they don't feel connective, to, uh, connected to the leadership team. So they churn out fairly regularly. Um, you know, right. you spend that money in other places. You just don't know it. You know, yep. um, before we close and we're putting up Mike's contact information on the screen again, uh, Mike, can you share about the different types of positions that professionals that uh, I'm sorry, instant work professionals can help fill in a warehouse setting. Sure. Um, yeah, I think when we look at warehouse operations, uh, for the most part, we're working with businesses to fill general labor positions, whether it's picker packer, um, you know, loading, unloading. So um, generally, folks who can come in and learn the expectations quite quickly. So um, I know, especially as you know, peak season starts to approach, this is a huge need for for lots of operators that we work with. So. Um, I think the best way to find out, you know, if we can service the the types of roles or positions you're looking for is to have a conversation with us. Again, you can check out our website, learn a little bit more there. um, And we'd love to, you know, continue the conversation. Right. And that website, again, is instawork.com. You see it on your screen. And thank you, gentlemen. Very good. I really appreciate the the, uh, very good, informative hour that we've had today. And we want to remind our viewers that shortly after this live event, we'll send you an email reminder. So you can access the presentation again on demand. You can view it again, or you can also share it with a colleague. Once and more, thanks again to JB and Mike for a very informative yeah. session. Yes, go ahead, please. I was going to say, and, and as you guys can tell, I love talking about this stuff and problem solving and whiteboarding through it. So if anybody on the call has any interest in talking through any of the practices, 
um, we we're, we oftentimes will share some of the materials and things that we've used internally. So uh, we we really do want to uh, create an environment and economy in which um, you know everybody's seeing really great growth. Uh, you know, and and I think it's it's important for companies to think about. Um, you know, the structural changes that need to happen to make sure that we don't have these kind of great resignations so often. So please reach out to me on LinkedIn um, or on Twitter. I'm pretty active on there. Uh, it's just my, my full name. Um, I'd be happy to, to reach out and talk to anybody one-on-one. -on -one. Great. Thank you again, JB. Thank you, Mike. And thanks, everybody, for being a part of our conversation today. For all of us at DC Velocity, I'm Dave Maloney. Have a great day.